Previously on Barefoot Boys, we watched Nagendra Prasad Shorbadikari grow into a young man and launch no fewer than four football clubs before he was 18. And in parallel, we saw the formation of the Indian National Association in Calcutta as a firm step in presenting a unified Indian agenda to the British on matters of governance. You know, uncanny coincidences in history are remarkably easy to find once you know what to look for. Take the formation of the Shobhabaja Club, for instance. The Shobhabaja family was royalty. They came into prominence in the middle of the 18th century and were the zamindars of the Shobhabaja area in Calcutta. Maharaja Nabokrishna Deb, the founder of the Shobhabaja Raj family, was the original Bengali Babu. He started off as the Persian tutor of Warren Hastings and then ended up as the clerk and interpreter of Robert Clive. Many narratives suggest that Nabakrishna Deb was part of the clique of native Babus who betrayed the Nawab Siraj ud Daula during the Battle of Plassey. In fact, here's an interesting little nugget about the origins of Durga Puja celebrations. The story goes that Clive wanted to offer thanks for his victory at Plassey, but found that the only church in Calcutta had been destroyed by Siraj ud Daula's troops during the siege in 1756. So, Nabakrishna invited him for a Durga Puja at the newly constructed Shobhabaja Rajbari, their family mansion, and lo and behold, the trend was set. With the same spirit of one-upmanship we see in the panels of today, other merchants and prominent families started hosting pujas in their own mansions. They wanted to cement their own relationships with the British, and they wanted to show off these relationships to all and sundry. It's never just about who you know. It's also about telling everyone that you know who you know. <laughs> Some things never change. The Shobha Bajar Pujo continues to be one of the biggest in Calcutta even today. You should try and visit if you can. Back to our story. The revolt of 1857 put the Shobha Bajar family in a difficult position. Especially Raja Radhakant Deb, who was the head of the family then. Radha Kanto, like other Calcutta merchants, could not afford to antagonize the British. So they barricaded themselves in their mansions with their own mini army standing guard and waited for the storm to pass. And once it had, Raja Radha Kanto Deb joined the Maharaja of Bordhuman and 2,500 other influential citizens of Calcutta in signing an address congratulating the Viceroy on the recapture of Delhi. It was a difficult time and people had to make their own choices. What matters to us is that the Shobha family managed to maintain excellent relations with the British. And here's where we meet them again in the 1880s with a brand new son-in-law whom we now know very well. That's right, Nagendra Prasad Shorbadikari married into the Shobha family. From Luminary, this is Barefoot Boys a podcast about an Indian football team that went toe-to-toe with the British and against all odds emerged as a national symbol. A symbol that told a country fighting for independence, we can win. I'm Konkona Sen Sharma. So, Nagendra Prasad marries into the Shobhabajar family. And what does he do with his noteworthy alliance? Remember, he's just disbanded the Wellington Club because his fellow club members wouldn't let Moni Das, a confectioner's son, join. You guessed it, he sets up the Shobhabajar Club. Gets one of his prominent members to sign on as a patron and joint secretary along with himself and gets the Maharaja of Kuchbihar appointed as president. And not just that, he made sure that the prejudiced Wellington Club attitude had no place here. He was clear that as far as the field was concerned, the football clubs that he set up were going to be open to players of all classes and castes. 
This is sports historian Koushik Bondhapadhyay again. And he clearly stated that he was not going to allow any elements to interfere with the meritocracy that he tried to build up in Wellington club. And that was why after disbanding the club uh, in three years, in two years time, probably when Nagendra Prasad got married to uh, the family of Shobhabajar, he uh, renovated, in fact, resuscitated the Shobhabajar club. And again, in the Shobhabajar club, although it, it represented a decadent landowning family, uh, he threw open uh, the gates uh, to all uh, sections of society and Monidash was registered in the Shobhabajar team. So, Nagendra Prasad's caste I mean, fight against caste-based discrimination was really unique in the field of sports, uh, at least at that point of time. And there was another benefit to having the Shobha Bajar family, known for their cosy relationships with the British, as chief patrons. British traders had set up their first football club in 1878, nearly 10 years before Nagendra Prasad set up the Shobha Bajar club. They called it the Trades Club. About a year later, the traders donated a trophy worth 500 rupees and started the Trades Cup, a football tournament exclusively for British players. No Indian player, club or team could participate in it. But in 1889, the Shobhabaja club was invited to play in the Trades Cup just a year after it was founded. It was unprecedented. Unfortunately, we don't know the name of the British team who played against Shobha Bajar in that first match, nor do we have the result or any remnant of a match report. These are lost to history. What is remembered though, what got everyone's attention, especially the Britishers, was the fact that the players of the Shobha Bajar club chose to play without boots. Now, whether this was still due to lack of access to shoes or boots or because playing barefoot actually helped their game, we don't know. But historian Partho Chatterjee has a theory which he outlines in his book, Black Hole of Empire. Most people in Bengal wore sandals that did not cover the whole foot. One can easily imagine Bengali schoolboys discarding their slippers, if they were wearing them at all, before running excitedly onto a football field. Interestingly, players develop technical skills of dribbling, passing, shooting, the sliding tackle that fully utilize the flexible movements of the bare foot including the toes. And in stark contradiction, here's journalist Devashish Mojumdar, author of the history of the football clubs in Calcutta. So it was also a very difficult for them to get well boots. And uh, certain boots, they were so hard and heavy that it was very impossible for the native players to carry on them. And throughout the lifelong, they were not habituated with the boots. As the Europeans, they were habituated with the boots. They, they, it was a part of their dressing and they were accustomed with the kind of boots that were made in England and that were suitable for playing football. But for the natives, it was not possible. Chatterjee has also argued that there was a political aspect to playing barefoot. In the context of Bengal, where Indian players generally played barefoot against British players wearing boots, the question of manliness acquired a somewhat special significance. There was added manliness, as it were, in a barefoot player coming out the winner against a crunching tackle from a booted player, stealing the ball with a deft flick of the toes, or slicing through the defence with a series of magical feints and dribbles. This manliness, in short, was the ability to prevail over a technologically superior opponent by sheer courage, skill and cleverness. And there is one colourful little detail that football writer Shomna Chengupta shared. It made me laugh out loud in sheer delight. Barefoot players would also wrap borders of saris around their feet for protection and to get better grip. <laughs> to think this was one use that our saris were put to. Desi Jugad at its best. Now, the more matches Shobha Bajar club played, the more renowned it became in Calcutta and the more members it attracted. And this in turn inspired the formation of at least a dozen other clubs. National Association, Town Club, Kumar Tuli, Chandanagar Sporting, Chinsura Sporting, Aryan Club and of course Mohan Bagan and Mohammedan Sporting Club, two of Kolkata's big three. Even the founding of Wari Club in 1898, all the way in Dhaka, can be attributed to the Shobha Bajar effect. Now, while all of this was going on, the founder of the Shobha Bajar Club, Nagendra Prasad Shorbadikari, 
was on yet another mission. With the Shobha Bazaar Club, he had managed to give an Indian football team access to a British tournament. But he felt that wasn't enough. Not only should Indians be able to play football alongside Britishers, Indians could very well beat the Britishers at their own game. He wanted to counter the British perception of weak Indians and Bengalis. You remember I told you about Nagendra threatening a man who just lightly made fun of his physique? Physical prowess and its appearance and acknowledgement was high up on Nagendra's list. And interestingly, there was another man who agreed with Nagendra, Narendra Nath Datta. Narendra Nath Datta grew up in Calcutta in the 1880s and he loved sports. He was a gymnast, a wrestler, a swimmer, he rode horses and competed in dumbbell events. He was quite an all-rounder. Datta would grow up to be one of India's iconic leaders, a monk, a philosopher who would take Indian philosophy and Vedanta to the world. But the reason he's relevant to this story is because he once said, "You will be nearer to heaven through football." than through the study of the Gita. For those who still haven't guessed, Narendra Nath Datta is Swami Vivekananda. Like Nagendra Prasad, Vivekananda too was a strong believer in muscular strength, fitness and good sporting talent. In fact, historian Shobhik Naha tells this story. Vivekananda was in Paris playing golf with the son of his disciple Francis Leggett. So he asked the boy pointing to the flag at the far end of the golf fling that what's the function of that flag what does it signify so Hollister told Swami Vivekananda that that that's where the golf hole is and the players try to put the ball through the hole and they make seven to eight hits in order to get the ball across the entire golf course so Vivekananda wagered with him that he can do it in just one hit, which was kind of impossible for the general golf players. So nobody believed him, and even Mr. Leggett was on the scene at the time. So he even wagered uh, ten dollars with Swamiji that if you can do it, I'll give you ten dollars. Hollister said, "I will give you half dollar." That that's what the poor guy had with him. So Swamiji just took the golf club took a swing and apparently the ball landed directly into the golf hole. So that's where the story ends. So Mr. Leggett was absolutely bamboozled. How can you do it? Is it kind of a magic by an Indian saint or a monk or what was it? Vivekananda said, no, this is purely hand-eye coordination, muscle power and discipline and willpower. And closer to home, when Swami Vivekananda was attending a felicitation ceremony in the Shobha Bajar Rajbadi, it seems he pointed at a man and said, we need more strong men like him. That man he was pointing at? Nagendra Prasad Shorbadikari. Nagendra Prasad's efforts finally bore fruit at the Trades Cup in 1892. The Shobha Bajar Club defeated the East Surrey Regiment of the British Army 2-1. It was the first time in recorded history an Indian team had won against a British one. They didn't win the cup, but this victory was so prominent that it was noted in the British press. Some newspapers rubbished it and said such a win was not significant. But there were others who were worried that Indians were winning in more ways than just mere sport against the British. The colony had made the empire sit up and take notice, albeit in a small way. They didn't know what was coming. If they did, I'm willing to bet that their reactions wouldn't have been as measured. Because around the time of the Shobha Bajar win, in the Jor Bagan area in Calcutta, a new club was starting to rumble to life. Next on Barefoot Boys, the story of Mohan Bagan, the club that shifted the goalposts in colonial India. Barefoot Boys is a luminary original podcast produced by Rainshine Entertainment and you've been listening to me, Konkona Sen Sharma. Gaurav Vaz is our executive producer, Vivek Madan is our director and script supervisor. Our writing team was led by Vivek Madan, Vikram Shah and Archana Nathan who wrote these episodes along with Shankhudeep Sengupta, Nevin Thomas, Arka Bhattacharya and Amar Shiyas. We recorded the podcast at Island City Studios with Ashir Balsara. Sachi Rajadhaksh is our sound designer and audio producer. And Ayan Dee mixed and mastered these episodes. Thanks to all our guests and experts for their time and valuable inputs. 
and a special thank you to Sidin Vadukut for his help getting this podcast off the ground. And most of all, thanks to the Omo Rakadosh, 11 men who did the impossible, who taught a country to dream and for a brief moment showed us what freedom felt like long before we were free.